Let us pray. Lord God, you touch the world with your living, breathing, resurrected Son. May we touch others as he has touched us with his love. Amen. I want to begin by um, inviting you to grab a sanctuary Bible near you and finding the Gospel of Luke chapter 24 and just keep that open. And Graham's going to find that. There you go, that picture. We'll keep that up for the sermon. The Gospel of Luke chapter 24. It's a little difficult task today because... Our gospel reading is really just uh, the ending of the whole story that flows together. So I'll have to do a little bit of recap, but I want to start here with this statue. I remember growing up a white statue of the risen Jesus in the narthex of our uh, church, my childhood church, and I was fascinated with it. It stood encased in glass, but it had an opening in the front of the glass. And I remember there were some vines or some greenery down um, at the feet of the statue. I think it was a pretty popular reproduction, and I looked this up. Um, it's actually a, a sculpture of Jesus, um, and it was um, created by Bertel, Bertel Thorvaldsen, a Danish sculpture from the 19th century. It's called Christus Consolator. Well, one Sunday morning after worship, as all the adults crowded into that, that space to visit after, after worship, I waited, you know, as a child, I just waited and found a place by the statue amid all the noisy chatter going on. And for the first time, I looked and noticed that there were holes in Jesus' feet. I reached down and I touched one. And so excited with my discovery, I shouted, Hey, Dad, look! Why are there holes in Jesus' feet? And um, I remember it got kind of quiet around that part of the narthex for a moment. And Dad leaned over and explained that that was where the nails held Jesus' body to the cross. But I have to say, I didn't really understand, though, in particular, Jesus resurrected, but still with the marks of the wound still there. What could that mean? Well, seeing is not necessarily vision. Seeing can just be on the surface of what's before us, not understanding what we see. And this is what's happening in the whole chapter of Luke's Gospel there. People see, but they don't see. And this difficulty is repeated three times on Easter. First the women, then Cleopas and the disciples walking out to the village of Emmaus, and then the disciples all gathered in a room in Jerusalem. Each has encountered some news or some evidence of the resurrection, and yet they struggle to believe. The women come to the tomb, and it's empty. Instead, they're met by two messengers in dazzling white, and they greet the women, saying, He's not here. He has risen. Cleopas and another disciple walking out to Emmaus, um, have already heard this uh, rumor from the women. Um, they consider it a delirious tale. And then Jesus, the risen Jesus, actually comes up alongside them while they're on this seven-mile walk, and they don't recognize him. The disciples in that room in Jerusalem have seen and heard even more. The women's report, Peter runs to the tomb uh, to see it's true, uh, for himself, see for himself, he also encounters Jesus. Uh, the disciples from Emmaus uh, finally recognize who's with them, and they come all the way back, seven miles, back to that room of disciples in Jerusalem to say, Jesus is alive and we saw him, and still more is needed. Like reminders. So I want you to look at these verses now. Look at verse 6 in your Bible, verse 6. These are the women at the tomb, and the two messengers tell them, Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and crucified, and on the third day rise again. All right, go to verse 25. This is the disciples uh, walking to Emmaus. 
with the stranger who uh, begins to open up the scriptures and, um, and so forth. So it's Jesus saying, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have already declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter his glory? And then verse 44. The disciples are in the room and Jesus suddenly appears to them. And he has to remind them too. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Reminders were needed of what they had already been taught, but they didn't yet have the insight to understand until after Easter, after the resurrection. Notice, too, then, how do they finally recognize Jesus? How do they recognize him? Cleopas and the other disciple prevail upon this stranger to come and share a meal with them. He does. Jesus blesses and breaks the bread, and they see it's him. And then he vanishes. Um, Jesus comes to the disciples in the crowded room. And there, again, it's the same story. More is still needed. He sees his friends' surprised faces and blinking eyes. They're incredulous. And so, even though they see him in the opening of the scriptures, they see him in the meals, more is needed. And here's what he finally does. He draws them to look at something real. Real flesh and blood. His hands and his feet, his wounded hands and feet, his crucified and risen hands and feet. And then there's this weird thing, and you know I always love those weird things in the gospel story about the broiled fish. Maybe that caught your attention too. So um, that should remind us of good times, old times, right, with the fishermen disciples. That remind you of loaves and fishes, right? <clears throat> Feeding of the 5,000. 